welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we try to build a better world. We try. Today, we've got Russell Gold on the program. Russell, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me, Matt. We were talking about all getting all sweaty and dirty and the terribleness <laughs> of heat. And I think it's an interesting, interesting intersection into you and your work. Why, why energy reporting? Why did you get involved with the environment? What's the deal? Well, uh, you know, I always say it was sort of a love story. I moved down to Texas uh, in the mid 90s without, you know, to a job in a local paper. I met someone, fell in love with them and decided to stick around Texas. And if you're going to be a reporter in Texas, you look around and sort of say, what, what's an interesting beat? And energy was the beat. I mean, that was that was the most interesting business stories around Texas. So I stuck with it. Yeah, it was that or the Cowboys. And things have changed. A ton. <laughs> things have changed a ton since then. Well, actually, no, it wasn't that or the Cowboys. It was that or Walmart. The other option that, that the Wall Street Journal covered out of Texas was Walmart. And that just I, retail didn't hold an interest for me. No, if you had gone Amazon, though, you might have had some interesting stock <laughs> options there or something. So, yeah, yeah. So energy, you, you were an author, you're a reporter. What is your take on where we are at today before we start to get into it? Sure. Just on energy itself. I mean, uh, there are lots of ways we can go go at that. I mean, the, the big picture uh, to me, the big trends that are going on, there are really two. Uh, one is that we are still in the early innings of uh, fracking. Uh, there's this new technology. It's 20 years old right now, but we have more natural gas than we know what to do with. And that is having a big long term impact. The other major story uh, is that renewable energy has gotten really, really inexpensive and is becoming, those are the two big disruptive forces right now uh, in the energy world. Cheap natural gas and cheap renewables. I don't know anything else that can compete with it long term. Uh, you know, oil is still sticking around because it's good to make plastics with. And frankly, we have what? Uh, seven, eight decades worth of infrastructure built up to, to move cars around on, on oil. But, uh, you know, if, if you're thinking long term bet, if you're thinking the next 10 or 20 years, uh, gas and renewables are, are really going to continue to disrupt the entire energy world. Let's double click fracking first. We haven't talked that as much. Sure. Pros and cons okay. of fracking. Let's hear them. Pros of fracking are, are pretty easy. Um, enormous amounts of energy are available in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, relatively easy to get at, uh, lots of natural gas. The cons, uh, we haven't figured out how to get uh, at all this natural gas without it leaking everywhere. And this is the methane leakage story we, we've heard about. We kind of know how to do it. We just are not very good at doing it. Uh, and so we're squandering a lot of the climate benefit of gas. When gas comes on 10 years ago, um, we start to having tons of cheap gas, coal just gets knocked completely off uh, off the pedestal. Uh, and if you look at the percentage of electricity in the United States from coal, it's just gone down and down. Same story in the United Kingdom. And the same story, believe it or not, looks like it's starting to possibly happen even in India as well. Um, so, you know, natural gas, huge climate benefits there, but could be better. And, and you know, if we could just figure out, well, if we could figure out how to build a contained system uh, so the natural gas doesn't leak, we'll be in much better shape. Yeah, so methane is a big problem with animal agriculture, something like 20% of yeah. emissions. Methane's a big part right. of that. The, the cows like to fart. And now we're, we're, like pull, fart. we're pulling more methane out of the earth. What does that look like on a scale basis? Um, in terms of the, the, the scale of, of natural gas and, and the scale of, of the global production of natural gas, is that what you're wanting to know? And how much methane are we getting from fracking? What type of actual impact is well, that? Well, methane having? is natural gas. I mean, we sort of have these different words for it, but methane is natural gas. What's the, the leakage same... percentage, I guess? Oh, leakage percentage, it's relatively small. Uh, it's single digits, but uh, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, it's it's unlike carbon dioxide, which stays in the atmosphere. Um, CH4, methane, natural gas, uh, doesn't last that long. But in terms of its ability to reflect sunlight, to capture the sunlight, to heat up the earth, uh, it's very potent. So even small amounts have have an outsized uh, impact. So I was listening to one of your videos a while back, I think, 100 new yeah. fracking fracking developments a day. Yeah, yeah, fracking wells a day. Um, it's pretty stunning what what's happened. Uh, you know, we're we're just 
every pretty much every well onshore in the United States or onshore almost anywhere in the world uh, is going to use some version of fracking. Uh, it is a big industrialized process uh, and lots of water usage, chemicals. I mean, a lot of what you've heard about fracking is true. Some of it's not, you know, the, the, the Josh Fox, everyone's faucet's going to light on fire was fairly overplayed, I would say. There have been certainly some situations, uh, some environmental concerns on a localized basis. Uh, but, um, you know, the sort of the story that, you know, everyone's, faucets will be on fire has not played out but there's a serious environmental impact on fracking i mean i tried to make the argument in the boom in my first book uh that fracking could be harnessed in a beneficial way and, and it was a hard argument to be made and, and trust me i'm not sure a lot of people embraced it but the argument i wanted to make and i tried to make is look if we're not if we're not generating the electricity the energy excuse me we use here in the united states we're going to be importing it. We're going to be importing it from Nigeria. We're going to be importing it from Trinidad, other places where there will be environmental benefits. We just won't pay attention to it. If we're producing the energy we need here in the United States, we're going to focus more on it. We're going to figure out the mistakes. We're going to figure out how to build the wells so that we don't have leakage, so that we're not losing uh, underground water resources, so that methane's not leaking. That was the argument I made. I would say I was 75% right. Um, I mean, the book came out five years ago. The, the, the two things I didn't account for were, one, methane leakage, nobody's really addressed it. Not, not in an effective way, and that's still a, a big problem. Um, the other thing I, I got wrong, frankly, or I didn't see the, the importance of, was that when fracking first came about, it was all about natural gas. Then they, you know, the industry took fracking, they went to the Permian Basin, and they started getting tons of oil, barrels of oil, millions and millions of barrels of oil. Um, I did not see that. Nobody really saw it. It was, a, it was a real kind of step change. So frackings turned out to be just as important in the oil world as it was in the natural gas world. I hear it's much dirtier in the oil world, though. Is that where fracking gets such a bad reputation from? No, fracking's reputation really started with with natural gas. I mean, you know, by the time 2010, 2012 rolled around, fracking's reputation was pretty solid and it really hadn't taken off in the oil world yet. So, um, you know, it, here's I it's been about a year since I drove through the Permian Basin. But if you drive through this incredible, incredible oil development, um, it is dirty. There's a lot of air emissions. There are trucks everywhere. The roads are completely torn up. Um, you know, it's out in West Texas. It's in, an, it's in a part of the country which is used to energy development. Uh, but it is, it's a dirty, nasty business. Speaking of going flip side, we talked renewables. Solar's coming yes. way down. Wind is coming way mm -hmm. down. They offset each other a bit. What are, the, what are your thoughts in terms of how you see the energy futures going Right now, the renewables coming down so much. When can we replace more and more of this? Uh, well, we're, we are – the percentage of electricity that's being generated by wind and solar has been steadily marching upwards. Um, what's going to happen though, and we're plucking a lot of this low-hanging fruit, a lot of the easier places to build solar and to build wind. What we need to do uh, if we want to have a conversation right now about – what is it? We're at about 10 to 12 percent wind and solar on the electricity grid. Huge step change from 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was like 2 percent. So we're way up. But if we want to get up to 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, um, what we need to do is talk about transmission. We need to figure out ways to build these big wires. And the reason to do that, it's a networking issue. You know, the more you can network, I mean, networking works for Google, it works for Facebook. Um, if you net, if you have a bigger network to move electricity around, then you can generate wind and solar where it's good to do it, uh, where there's good wind, where there's good solar and low population density, and then move it to where the people are. And, uh, if we do that, I mean, all of the models have shown us that we can drive down costs, drive down green, greenhouse gases, uh, and get up north of 50% renewable electricity. Now, there are people out there talking about 100%, and I'm not against that. I'm not saying we need to stop. I'm just saying first step is let's get to 50%, and then we can talk about where to go from there. Because once you get past about 70 80%, it starts to get really expensive. 
And I think what we can do is we can get to that 70 or 80 percent without increasing costs, which is important. Uh, and then we can figure out where we want to go from there. Now, I will say this is sort of an interesting new development, something I've only kind of become aware of in the last few days. But there are two or three major federally funded studies that looked at this issue. They came out of the National Renewable Energy Lab, out of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which uh, looked at how do we build transmission to get renewables uh, up uh, as a percentage. And those studies have disappeared. One of the studies was removed from the internet, um, from the NOAA website. Another study apparently has gone into a deep hiatus before it gets published. So there's been a definite pushback uh, from the Department of Energy on these studies. Uh, and uh, I certainly feel very strongly that uh, they need to be out there to have people debate them, to learn from them, uh, and uh, to use them uh, to, to, to build out a new energy future. Do you think the, the pushback against them has primarily been the new government administration? I don't know exactly, uh, but I suspect that's probably part of it, that there was probably some mid-level uh, bureaucrat who looked at this political pointy and said, you know what, this doesn't fit with the message we're trying to get out, which is a pro-nuclear, pro-coal message. Uh, and so why are we promoting this on a website? Let's remove it or, you know, let's go back and study this more before we print the results. So um, it's disappointing. Uh, this is these are this is a federal government. These are these are federal tax dollars at work paying for these studies. What the studies found is fascinating. We can get much higher renewables. We can get the, there at a lower cost. Um that seems to me, I mean, as a federal, as a taxpayer, I want that information out there. Is the coal push anything other than cronyism? <sighs> there's a little, little bit that I would say that, that there's some truth to. And that is that um, there is, which is beyond just cronyism. I think there's a lot of cronyism in there. Let's just put that out there. Uh, in addition I think there is a, a concern among some people that when you move away from what are called baseload assets, big coal plants, big nuclear plants that we built our entire system off of that run 24 hours a day, uh, these workhorse plants, that if we move beyond that, we're going to lose reliability, that we're going to have a system that's less reliable, that doesn't work. And my response to that is, and, and that's a genuine concern. Some of the most conservative people I know, not conservative in a political sense, but a conservative in let's make sure this works 99.9% .9 of the time are the grid operators. They have to be conservative. Uh, when you talk to, and I did this, interview the grid operators in places where there's a lot of wind, uh, especially places like the Great Plains, they will come and say, look, we didn't think, we thought when we got to 10%, we got to 15% wind on the grid. Uh, that we'd have major reliability problems. They have overcome those fears. They figured out how to make it work. And some of the pushback uh, that we're seeing in places like Ohio and the Northeast are, are partially grid operators who are concerned, but mostly it's companies that own these giant coal plants and don't want to see them go away because they're essentially printing money out of them right now. Um, and also, frankly, uh, politicians that don't want to lose the jobs associated with them. Should we just have a, a depreciation write off for all bullshit energy and let, <laughs> let companies that have essentially died and gone past that, that put them out to pasture, but at least they can reap what they but can you, reap from that? You said that a little flippantly, but there's a there's a genuine discussion out there right now, which is that should we just pay um, a some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of a bond, essentially, for these depreciated assets that are just sort of sticking around and to sort of, you know, if you to close down your coal plant, we'll give you this much money. Um, and there are some people who argue that that would be a more effective use of federal tax dollars than something like uh, the tax credits right now that are used for solar and storage and some of the other assets. So that's the best that if you want to talk about the best use of money. Yeah, give them give them money. I mean, look, when a lot of these coal plants were built, they weren't built you know, it's not like someone sat down and said, you know, rubbed their hands together and said, you know, we're going to pollute the entire, you know, we're going to create all these greenhouse gases. I mean, they were built to generate electricity so that we all could turn on our televisions. They were built, you know, for good reasons. And then later on, 
um, you know, 70s and 80s, 90s, as the science comes out of the problems with greenhouse gases, they're stuck with these, you know, the, 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 they went into heavy debt for them. And then what do you do with them? So if the federal government wants to come out and say, we will pay you to shut these down and pay to retrain the workers, that would be a potentially interesting use of money. Even if it was just tax cuts on writing it off and faster depreciation or something. Yeah, you, you, Abs you think. Absolutely. Right. So why haven't we invested more in building out a more robust renewable grid basically we need wires running you don't think that small scale will handle it um we haven't done that for a couple of reasons first of all we we don't have a single electrical grid in the united states we kind of have three we have the eastern the western and texas but even within that, we really have 50 different small grids. Each state runs their grid, controls the politics of their grid. And it is really, really hard to get Arkansas to play well with Tennessee, to get Louisiana to play well with Texas, uh, you know, to get California. You know, I, I can go on and on. It's proven to be incredibly difficult to get these different grids to work together. Um, and that's sort of a historical accident. We created these regional grids to promote their development 100 years ago, and they became these powerful political institutions, and they don't want to, you know, do these kind of massive interconnections that we need. Uh, th that's one reason. Um, yeah, that's probably, I would say that's, that's the biggest reason that, that I encountered. They just don't want to play well with each other. They don't want to play with each other. They don't play well with each other. How big is the problem caused or is it caused by the fact that the U.S. government outsources infrastructure to companies? <laughs> you know, I actually think that if we outsource to companies, that would be a benefit, right? There is lots of money sitting on the sidelines right now that wants to invest in green, renewable developments, but can't find good projects. I think if the federal government would do a better job of paving the way for these type of investments, we'd actually move more quickly along this energy transition. How do we do it without granting monopolies? <laughs> well, monopolies, I think, is what, what got us got us in this problem in the first place. You know, we we created these mono these regional monopolies. We told Southern Company that they basically ran not just the grid, but all the power generation in the southeast. And then uh you know, we let them go for 60 years. And by the time we looked at it again, they were these incredibly powerful political institutions that were really, really hard to dislodge. So I think monopolies are part of the problem. I would love to see more competition. No, I agree. Um, you know, but I would say not yeah. creating monopolies is the problem, but granting them. So like if you look at if you look at um, ban, I mean, if you look at the cell and telecom industry, it's basically you guys ah. can own this spectrum and that's all there is. Sorry, deal with it. Right. Um, I don't think you need to create monopolies. So in, in, in my recent book, Superpower, I wrote about uh, an entrepreneur, an energy developer who wanted to build a, a, basically a large extension cord, right, from Oklahoma into Tennessee. It was a monopoly. I mean, anyone who wanted to use that and was ready to pay the money to use the, the capacity on it could use it. I mean, it was a business opportunity. Now, where it started, it appealed to wind developers. And there were lots of wind developers who were chomping at the bit to, to, to get in there. But it, it, it wasn't a monopoly. And then on the other end, he didn't want to sell to one company. He wanted to sell to like five or six companies. So it, it was... You know, it was a it was building a new road, basically, you know, and, and uh, you know, when you build a road, uh, you know, Amazon's going to use it to deliver packages and Walmart's going to use it to stock up their superstores. And, you know, I'm going to use it to take a vacation. So it's a basic piece of infrastructure. If I gave you a magic wand, what would you do? What would you change about energy and how would you improve it? <sighs> magic wand? Um, I would make batteries much more efficient. And much better. Uh, if you want to change one thing about energy right now that would have massive ripple effects and be an enormous disruption, it's a better battery. So that's the biggest thing holding us back right now, storage? <sighs> it's a big it's a big issue. Um, you know, a combination of storage and transmission can really help us get 
to a very, very low carbon future. Um, but man, storage would be such a big deal. Can you imagine if, you know, let's see, I, I drive a Honda CRV right now. And if I put 12 gallons into it, um, if I'm lucky, I get 25 miles a gallon. I hate to say, what is that? 300, my range is 300 miles, uh, versus, uh, a Tesla, you know, I'm going to get pretty close to that. Probably about 250. What if there was a better battery? What if I got a thousand miles on my Tesla? What if, I mean, we know electric cars are better in a lot of ways, right? They don't break down as much. There are fewer parts. Uh, you, you know, so you don't have to take them to the mechanic. You don't have to take them for oil changes. What if, and, and my God, they're fun to drive because their acceleration is phenomenal. But what if in addition to that, uh, you know, I, I could get a thousand miles on a charge, you know, go much further than I could uh, in my car. Uh, that would be a battery. What if from my roof uh, I could store up enough, you know, solar power so that if there was a week's worth of disruption, I could run my entire house on it. Uh, there are all these different things that could happen uh, if we have a better, cheaper battery. I'm not sure we're going to get there. There's a lot of chemistry, and I'm not a chemist. There's a lot of materials uh, science. So there's a question as to whether we can get there. But if, but you gave me the wand, and that's how I'm going to use it. As long as we get there without it being explosive, when there's so much energy in such a small thing, it could have some interesting consequences. Oh, no, no question. I mean, you know, think about, uh, I mean, look, lithium-ion batteries, right? That That's... The, the chemistry, the, the battery construct that's won so far is the lithium ion. That was, the, that was what was responsible for the exploding laptops a few years ago. Uh, and one of the earliest large electricity storage uh, projects um, outside of Phoenix, Arizona, had a massive fire um, and uh, sent something like 20 firefighters to the hospital a couple months ago. So, look, no source of energy is perfect. If we build up a system with lots of transmission, lots of wind, lots of solar, and lots of batteries, we're still going to have problems with it. So, uh, uh, you know, my, my magic wand only goes so far, I suppose. Yeah, energy is inherently powerful. What do you think about Tesla mm -hmm. and Elon and what they're doing? You know, I am. he has created something. He's created an incredible brand. You know, and I give him all the respect in the world for that. Tesla... Even if tomorrow he, he said, you know what, I can't make any more cars, financially it doesn't make sense. The Tesla brand itself, and that is a brand which has, you know, talks about changing the world, lower energy consumption, you know, cleaner energy. That's an incredibly powerful project. It has captured a lot of people's imagination. So he has, you know, huge respect on that. You know, what he did in solar, what he did with the power wall just didn't quite work. And, you know, Tesla's are, are wonderful cars, but, uh, you know, every time I take a look at the Tesla's financials, I scratch my head and wonder how it is. He's still in business. Same with Uber. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hold on a second. I got myself tangled up here. I'm going to have to untangle myself. No worries. I know All they're right. doing some really good stuff with the battery technology. Where do you see at Tesla? Yeah, where do you see the most interesting stuff happening? So, sorry about that. Um, I have heard of some interesting stuff going on with the Tesla batteries. Uh, there's a lot of fundamental research that's still going on in universities. Um, most of the corporate focus right now is just on driving down cost. You know, let's let's see how how low we can produce lithium ion uh, cells for. So I would say I would kind of keep my eyes on universities um, and uh, maybe a couple of startups that Breakthrough Ventures is funding uh, and Tesla. I mean, anyone who's working on batteries has the capacity to make a really interesting fundamental breakthrough. But I would caution your listeners that I get about 10 emails a month claiming that they've invented this new breakthrough battery and none of them ever seem to to amount to a hill of beans and china's basically buying all the mines in congo what do you think about the production and the overall dynamics in the world for that yeah well that's a really <laughs> that that's uh well unfortunately cobalt mining involves uh a lot of potential for abuse uh for environmental abuse for human rights abuse uh, we have seen that. 
Um, it's not a pretty picture. And uh, we certainly don't want a situation in which our entire economy um, is based on lithium ion cells and uh, we can't build them because we don't control the cobalt. So uh, uh, it is something that is worrisome. Uh, but uh, as long as China remains a, a good trading partner, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Hopefully not. Yeah, usually you don't like to punch your punch your partners in the nose. That's a that's a whole nother can of worms. I don't think we need to yeah. get into it. Are you an optimist <laughs> or a pessimist? How, oh, how, do, you, how do you view yourself? I'm completely an optimist. I'm completely an optimist. I mean, let, let me take you back to fracking for a second. So 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, uh, there was this guy in North Texas who was trying to figure out a new way to build a well into a super dense rock. And he came upon this idea of doing a massive water flood and trying something no one else did. And he invented modern fracking. 21 years later, it's completely changed the world. So my question is, who out there is going to figure out uh, the new way to make a solar cell, the new way to make uh, wind, the new way to do this or to do that that's going to have a comparable impact? I mean, so far... What's happened over the last 10 years to push renewable energy um, from a really a niche product to something that's much more mainstream um, has been a global supply chain. It hasn't been a huge technological change. We haven't had some breakthrough like we did with fracking. We developed a global supply chain, which drove down prices. So somebody out there is trying to invent the next mouse, a better mousetrap. And when they do, it's going to be massively successful. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, the capitalist system has many flaws, but one thing it does right is that if you can build a better mousetrap, it will find the money to develop that system and spread it. And so, you know, we're waiting for, you know, somebody's going to come up with something brilliant and it's going to change the world. That that's my feeling. And I'm an optimist because of it. I would agree, but I think with the better mousetrap example, at least as an entrepreneur and someone who's done a bit of investing, the yeah, you got to be five to ten x better, not five to ten percent better. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the mousetrap doesn't really have the the extra umph it needs to get the adoption and change. People don't like change. Well, that's for sure. That's definitely for sure. But um, you know, I I still feel like there there there's look. I spent several years watching when Silicon Valley tried to get involved in clean tech and made all these investments, by and large, they weren't successful. Um, and then Silicon Valley sort of backed away and sort of said, no, we're, we're happy. We'll, we'll keep doing our, our software uh, investments. Uh, so I mean, I've watched some of the, this investment play out, but I'm still, I'm still an optimist. I'm still, there's a lot of fundamental research going on. And somebody's going to figure something out that will deliver those five to ten x returns, um, or five to ten x better uh, than the status quo. But I do agree with you. The power of the incumbent uh, energy technology is incredible um, and very difficult to dislodge. And that was one of the stories I covered in Superpower. You know, you had these incumbent utilities that just they did not want something that was better because it was disruptive to their business. I would agree. I think the problem with the Silicon Valley clean tech thing was the timeline. They have the 10 year fund cycles. If yeah. you can't think longer than that, you can't really change the world in the meaningful ways that at least large infrastructure projects need. But that's a problem. I mean, it's a problem it is, because we got to fix the incentives to fix the problem then. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, we were talking about big transmission lines before uh, and the entrepreneurs clean line that I wrote about, Michael Skelly and clean line, they took years just to get a yay or nay vote or whether they could build their infrastructure. Uh, we need to do a better job with big energy infrastructure to say, he, you know, here's your timeline. Maybe it's four years, maybe it's three years, but some, there needs to be a reasonable time frame in which you can get a yes or no vote. Uh, you know, something that takes seven to 10 years just to get the environmental impact statement, just to be told whether you can do something, it's not going to work. Investors are, not, are just going to shy away from it. Yeah, it's a, it's a major problem. How do you think about climate change today? 
I remain an optimist. Um, you know, I, I think we, we think about climate change in the wrong way. We sort of think about, you know, are we going to meet Paris or not? Are we going to uh, stop before we get to the two degrees of Celsius increase or not? Climate change is not a yes or a no. It's not a binary type of situation. Um, if we have one degree of temperature rise, that's going to be disruptive but a hell of a lot better than two degrees, which is a hell of a lot better than three or four. Um, climate change is a matter of degrees, you know, no pun intended. And we need to do everything we can to prevent uh, the worst and most catastrophic changes. Um, you know, you gave me a wand before and I said uh, I, would, I would wave it on batteries, but here's, here's something else. Maybe if I could take that back, I would love to see somebody come up with a system that can uh, uh, take in massive amounts of air and strip the carbon out uh, and, you know, and, and then you know, just stripping carbon out of air, sort of carbon mining from the air. Come up with a technology along those lines and we'll go a, a long distance towards uh, solving climate change. If you ever get a genie in the future, your first wish should be for unlimited <laughs> wishes. Just FYI. Well, no, I don't genies give you three wishes, so I've used two of mine so far. Oh yeah, but right. I'm not. Batteries. I'm, yeah, I'm not as effective of a genie. So right. well, we're trying to change change the world. We're trying to change people's perspective. I yeah. think having a having a cutoff in a lot of sense is more helpful, though. So, for instance. If you're overweight, it's much easier to not have junk food in the house. If you're alcoholic, right. you don't want to touch alcohol because every time mm -hmm. you have to make that decision. How do we get people and society on board to make these difficult changes when it is a, a collective benefits problem that doesn't affect us all that much until, it, until we're all screwed? That's a great question and one that I've struggled with. So first of all, you need some sort of social movement. There needs to be a, a social sense that um, that we're all in this together and that everyone has a role to play. Uh, social pressure, social cohesion is important. But even just as important as that um, is there need to be alternatives. Uh, look, I live in, in Texas. Mostly what I need to do, I have to drive. But if you build roads with good bike lanes, uh, if you build better public transportation, I will begin using that. So it's not just about personal choices. We need to have um, we need to have social choices out there as well. Uh, you can't expect people to choose uh, to to make the sacrifices that might be necessary if we don't give them good options. Even even so, if you need to get to Texas from one side to the other. A bike lane's not going to get you all that far. Is part of it just the the physical issues behind it? So it's a lot easier for Europe to implement stuff like this because Europe is designed yeah. as a small city. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, closer together, a lot easier to build um, a, to build rail, to build other uh, other technologies. Sure, but look, I'm not big on flight shaming. I mean, that's the new phrase. Uh, look, if people need to take flights, go for it. At the end of the day, climate change is not going – I'm not going to solve climate change by turning my air conditioner uh, and living you know, at 78 instead of 74 um, because that's not going to address the fact that you have millions and millions of people in places like Indonesia, uh, India, Bangladesh that are living in increasingly sweltering climates – and want air conditioning and want more air conditioning. What's gonna solve air conditioning is can we come up with a better air conditioner? Can we come up with a, a more energy efficient way to cool the air? Um, can we come up with something that just, you know, a new way to design cities, a new way to design houses that encourages more cooling and more uh, uh, cross ventilation? It, it's in some ways, climate change is a very much a design and a technology question, not a, personal, you know, some sort of you know, personal choices question. So 
Um, How do we avoid the innovation race, though? So this reminds me of something Ben Thompson once said about Snapchat's business model. And it was, okay. that it was he's the, the gingerbread man, Evan Spiegel. He runs, he runs just as fast as he can. And he hopes that Facebook doesn't catch up in time. And that's what it right. feels like with climate change. Do we have to invent a new solution continuously to fix it? Or are there incentives, not to fix it, but to slow it, to improve it? Or are there incentives that we can also shift to be able to make this easier than having to find the wild card which saves everything because we found the way to scrub the methane or the way to clean the blowers or et cetera. Right. Look, I, I think we're, we're a lot closer than we think. And because it's a market issue, 10 years ago, so I'm going to tell you something that 10 years ago would have been preposterous, would have gotten me locked up and fired from my job at the Wall Street Journal. And that is that in most places in the world, the cheapest way to generate electricity is wind or solar. Hands down, that's the truth now. And that technology keeps getting better, so it keeps getting cheaper. So we now have a way to generate lots of electricity. It's not exactly where it needs to be. It's maybe not exactly where the people live. We don't have the infrastructure. We've got too many incumbents standing in the way. But what we need to do is create a market structure to allow us to generate as much of that electricity as possible uh, and to move some of the more polluting forms of electricity off the system. We need to let the market uh, dictate. So, you know, whether that means some sort of carbon tax or some sort of price on the more polluting carbons that bring in the externalities, um, you know, if we can find the right structure, I think the market will move us much closer to uh, to slowing down the, the, the amount of greenhouse gases that we're releasing. Uh, and, you know, and the other thing is we need to continue to be innovative and we need to continue to have a healthy, robust economy. That's what's going to get us there. You said if we can figure out the way to do it, what is the way to do it in terms of? Well, that? yeah. Okay. So first of all, this is really important. We have the technology. It would be great to have some technological improvements, uh, you know, methane capture, stripping carbon dioxide out of the air, better batteries. That would be wonderful. But we have a lot of the basic building block technologies that we need. Uh, what I'm talking about is some sort of market structure which says we want that we're going to give an advantage. We're going to give um, uh, an incentive toward uh, energy that doesn't create carbon, that doesn't create greenhouse gases. Uh, we're going to create a new market structure that incentivizes that uh, and then let let the investors take over to build that out. We don't really have that right now. OK, so for you, there's a lot of ways we can do it. We just need to have the will to do it. I think there's a lot of political will uh, involved, um, and I think we need to find ways to speed up the the infrastructure that's required um, like transmission lines, uh, to, you know, it's, it, we can't, we've got people who want to build, build wind farms, but if we can't move those electrons to where the people are, if we don't have that basic infrastructure, it's not going to do us any good. And then what we need to do is have a market structure, which says you, which provides the incentives say, you know, a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour, but we're going to pay more for a kilowatt hour that doesn't also generate greenhouse gases. I like it. We, like, we tax the cigarettes. They're terrible for you. So you're a journalist. What's the state of the media industry today? <laughs> um, regional newspapers are in big trouble. Uh, when I was coming up, you know, there were many, many great regional newspapers. Dallas Morning News, Seattle Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Charlotte Observer, uh, Miami Herald, a lot of those newspapers are in big financial trouble right now. The national newspapers are still strong, and we're seeing uh, a, a great proliferation of online resources, uh, online news channels. Uh, but uh, but we are we're we're inventing the future in some ways faster. Um, well, no, excuse me. Let me flip that. We're sort of tearing down the old structure, the old way we train journalists, the old way we distributed news faster than the new forms are coming in, coming uh, down the pike. So I, I worry. I worry about, you know, my children and where they're getting their news from. 
because, you know, for them, there's just this great big sea out there of news and there's not as much differentiation um, as there used to be. And I think that's really opened up the, do the door for a lot of the, the fake news we've seen and a lot of the manipulation of social media to plant uh, propaganda. Is the expensive Wall Street Journal subscription or payroll the answer to having the funding needed to do journalism? You know, I think it's an answer for certain niche publications. We've managed to do it because uh, we've, you know, we have a, a long track record and there are lots of people who are willing to pay for that type of, of, of quality. Um, you know, the Washington Post has done the same. And you know, look, quality, people will pay for quality. And we found that. So paywalls help us uh, preserve those bastions of quality. Um, I think, but, but that's not the complete answer because we've got a whole generation of people coming up who are used to the, their news being free. So how do you convince them to you know, take out a subscription, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm, I'm kind of keeping a close eye on some of these new, these news aggregator sites, whether it's through Apple or, you know, my parent corporation, the parent corporation I work for, News Corp, is starting to, to put one of those out where you'll pay some sort of price uh, and they'll aggregate lots of different news sources for you and present it to you. A business, it's all about bundling and unbundling. We're it's uh, yeah. Look, the media business has been uh, it's, it's been tough over the last few years. And I've, I, there, there are days that I feel like I've got Stockholm syndrome trying to figure out how it how it is that over the tw last 25 years I've managed to survive in this business because I've seen many, many great reporters not be able to find jobs and have to go do other things. And it's problematic because in some ways that could be a good thing if the system was inefficient, but in other ways. Do we want only the people with the means to pay to have be able to have access to valuable, credible information? No, absolutely not. That's that's incompatible with democracy. You know, if you if you I mean, how can you if only people who've got the means can get access to good information, high quality information, news, um, you really can't run a democracy that way. Democracy requires everyone to have um, access to some level of news and discourse. So, I mean, that's, yeah. What do you think about? It won't work. Yeah. What do you think about state subsidized journalism or potentially some type of, some type <laughs> of democracy tax so that we keep our people not stupid? You know, it worries me whenever you talk about the state and, um, uh, and news that, that concerns me. Uh, however, you know, the BBC has done very well for many years and they, there was a, I forget exactly how, but there was some sort of state tax um, the, if we're going to do that, if we're going to have some sort of state collected tax or fee to fund good journalism, there's going to need to be a very strong, very robust way to keep the state apparatus and the press apart. So somehow the money's collected and it's going to have to go through some sort of independent uh, group to make sure that the government and politicians don't uh, exert undue influence on the news. Speaking of billionaires buying newspapers. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, that's been a, actually a very positive trend <laughs> recently. Uh, Washington Post is doing great. Wall Street Journal is doing great. Uh, the Atlantic uh, is much stronger than it used to be. Uh, there is definitely something to be said for having uh, – uh, a daddy war box with deep pockets uh, paying for the news. Unless it becomes Murdoch. So how do we avoid that? Long well, I, look, I work for, hey, I work for Murdoch. Um, mm -hmm. I work, you know, I work, uh, Wall Street Journal has been owned by Murdoch for, goodness, what, eight, ten years now uh, when they bought it from the Bancroft family, which, by the way, I've been watching Succession on HBO and just absolutely love it because it feels like I lived through part of that. Um, you know, say what you, I, I, I can tell you with all, with all sincerity that I have never felt the hand of Murdoch trying to guide my stories toward one political conclusion or another. Um, we have always had a very, you know, he, he's allowed the Wall Street Journal to pursue good, high quality journalism. You guys don't sell on advertising, though. You guys sell on value and primarily stock trading. I only I can only talk about what I know. OK, I just. I get a little worried. I feel like it gets into the same realm of the 
censorship debate with Facebook or Twitter. Well, yeah, you want Zuckerberg to not let this guy talk now, but what happens when it's not that guy in charge, but it's someone you don't trust? And I feel like right. you could have similar problems with the billionaires owning newspapers, and yet it also fixes a lot of the economic problems. How do you put those oh. safety rails in place? No, it's no. I mean, look, I it doesn't make me nervous uh, to see the Jeff Bezos of the world own the Washington Post. Of course, it does. Um, hopefully, over the years, the very rich families that have owned uh, the American media, the Chandlers, the Soulsburgers, the Bancrofts, uh, have seen it as a public trust, and hopefully, the next generation will continue that pattern. Uh, if they don't, uh, then I hope we, there's enough c competition. There are enough other news sources so that if the Washington Post, God forbid, down the road becomes something which is very clearly steered in one direction, that people have an alternative to go to. That could be an interesting pu push for you as a journalist or for someone to try to get, to try to get the to try to get the owners to foundationalize them, so to speak. So to set up trusts to manage the papers as opposed to managing them themselves. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, that would be interesting. But uh, but then, you know, I think part of the fun, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the billionaires buy these newspapers and buy these media outlets is because they want to be in the flow. They want to be they want to be in have a say in how this is all run and, and you know, feel the excitement that, that is journalism. And if you create a trust and you hire a bunch of gray beards who are former editors and, you know, uh, what's the fun of that? So I think it will be difficult. Uh, I think it is it is incumbent upon us in the media to not just broadcast to the public what's important about the news, but to also broadcast and, and convince our owners what's important so that hopefully they make the right choices. Yeah, got to keep the job. I want to jump to the lightning round. How's that sound? Okay, sure. Let's do it. And listeners, if you haven't already subscribed, if you subscribe to the level of five bucks or more per month on Patreon, you unlock five to ten bonus minutes here, some bonus episodes, free content, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And the podcast comes without ads. So disruptors.fm slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You ready? I'm ready. Let's jump back to the interview itself. How okay. often do people tell you you look just like Vince Vaughn? A um, couple times a month. A couple times a month, yeah. A couple I, times a month. I, I, I bumped into him once at uh, the Continental Club in, in Austin, Texas, and my wife told me I had to go stand next to him. Uh, he is slightly taller than I am. He's like, I noticed when you started and talking fast. Slightly more handsome also. Slightly more handsome. Slightly more rich as well, but that's okay. We'll <laughs> fix that. What technology or trend are you most excited about outside of energy and why? Outside of energy. What technology trend am I most excited about? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I came prepared to talk energy. What am I excited about outside of energy? Um, ah, I'm drawing a blank. Can I, uh, can I think about this for a minute or, or yeah, we can, I, yeah, we can jump back to it. Okay. Hold on. I, I was prepared to answer that for energy, but that's a good question. Let me think about something that's non. Oh, okay. Let's you ready. Yep. Okay. Uh, do you want me to just jump back into it or how do you yeah, want to? Yeah, just jump back okay. in. Um, I, I am fascinated and, and excited about the trend of, uh, that's going on in foods, you know, with this whole, it's not just the beyond meat, but trying to bring in protein from insects, just a whole new way of thinking about food, uh, and growing, uh, vertical farms in, in warehouses in cities to get, uh, production of food closer to where people are. I, th I, that, that all, I just find that all completely fascinating and I'm totally excited about it. Yeah. If we can start lab growing meat, then we have way more space for solar farms as well. <sighs> yeah. And yeah. we can actually reforest parts of the world. It'll be a, a wouldn't win, that be nice? A win, 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 except for, well, yeah, it'll be a win, win, win. What should okay. I have asked you about that? I didn't. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the one topic that we didn't cover was community opposition to, to wind uh, and to transmission and whether there's, you know, like we, uh, why people are so opposed to it. Why? Why should you have asked me or why are they opposed to it? No, why are they opposed? 
I think they're opposed. And one of the things that that I was really surprised by was that there was and and this was going on. I think we've all seen this more in the last couple of years, but there was an opposition to transmission line because the benefits, the money, the profits were going to flow to the coasts. And there were people in the middle of the country saying, look, what we have is land and you want to take our land and send profits somewhere else. And you there was no matter how much you talk to them about the social benefit, about how everyone would benefit from cleaner electricity. It did not matter. And uh, I was you know, just really surprised uh, by just how strong uh, those sentiments were. Yeah, it's frustrating. We're working together. You get a ten thousand dollar raise. I get a five thousand dollar raise. I feel like shit. It's uh, mm-hmm. some of the some of the human dynamics. It's it's quite frustrating. We've got to well, deal with them. But look, here's a perfect example. For 20 years, people talked about building offshore wind in the United States, and it went nowhere. There were legal fights. There were regulatory fights. There were political fights. The Kennedys fought it off off the Cape, um, off Nantucket. Uh, and then what happened? And and there was a key change that allowed so much more offshore wind to be envisioned and to begun to be built. And that key change was that the developers were started to go to the state capitals in the Northeast and say, hey, you know that dilapidated port that you've been trying to save jobs at? We can, you know, we're ready to invest. We're willing to, to bring hundreds of new jobs. So there was a sense, they sort of figured out the special sauce so that the benefits of this energy production were more widely spread. Well, we haven't quite figured out that special sauce yet. We haven't certain, pl- for, for onshore wind or for onshore solar, we haven't certain uh, ways, but there needs to be more of an effort to figure out how can we spread the benefits of this more broadly so that everyone feels, that everyone we're asking to make sacrifices feels that they're also benefiting. If you wanna get results, you gotta tell people what they wanna hear. Where- what would you recommend to people in terms of a quote or a call to action before you tell them where to find you? Ah, <sighs> for quote or a call to action. Um, you know, I'll go with the epigraph that I put into my book, superpower. Um, everyone always talks about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Uh, when it comes to climate, stop, Stop complaining about it. Stop talking about how climate change is horrible and start doing something. Start figuring out how you can get involved in some of the technology and the, the, uh, the innovation uh, and the new business models, the investment. Look, this is exciting. We can either look at what the next 20 or 30 years is going to bring and get overwhelmed and scared or we can get be excited by the opportunities. And I encourage everyone to be excited. Start doing something about it. Going Gandhi on climate change and the energy. I like it. Where Why can, not? Where can people find you, learn more about the books and all the good oh, stuff? Oh, sure. Well, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, www.russellgold.net or on Twitter at Russell Gold. And of course, guys, links and everything in the show notes, disruptors.fm. Check out the books. Check out Ross, uh, Russ. And if you guys enjoyed the episode, please be sure to share it with a friend helps us with growing our disruptive movement, so to speak, to fight climate change, build a better world, all the good stuff. Until next time, cheers. Cheers, Russ. Thanks a lot for having me.